you really made me rethink how I think about Jesus's resurrection, his marked body, and its relevance for our bodies. And, you know, because he's the model for us, right? And, and you tie it into disability studies. Can you, can you briefly give me that elevator pitch on how people can understand that connection with disability studies? Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Well, um, I, I suppose I came to that in part because um, I have a younger brother uh, named Mark who has Down syndrome and um, he still lives with my mom and dad still. So he's, he's doing fairly well. Although, you know, as a now um, 45 year old man, he's got all the opportunities and challenges that uh, pertain to uh, living with Down syndrome, you know, at that age. So, um, but uh, praise God for him. But in any case, at a certain point, you know, I was invited to think about the experiences of people with disabilities, thinking about life with my brother, Mark, um, and, you know, then thinking, well, what does redemption mean for people like Mark? And what does redemption mean for people like myself sharing life with Mark and all my parents, you know, who continue to be his caretakers uh, uh, even now at their advanced age? Um, what does redemption mean? Um, and of course, then the obvious question is, well, um, heaven, uh, how would we understand it, at least in popular imagination, means that Mark is healed or cured from his Down syndrome. And, and of course, how do we even understand that? And how do we unpack that? And um, what does it mean to be either healed or cured from Down syndrome? Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, uh, you know, there, you know there, there's the phenotypical dimension of, of what the features that people with Downs have. There is the behavioral dimension of how uh, people with Downs behave and of course, when I talk about these dimensions, I'm talking about broad spectrums because there is just no one phenotype. There's a spectrum, a Downs, a downs spectrum for a phenotype. There's a, a, a range of behaviors for, for Downs uh, folks, um, etc. cetera. And, and of course, then there's also the peculiarity of Mark as Mark, uh, you know, and, and his walk with Jesus and his uh, being shaped by life with just this set of parents and this set of brothers, not that set of parents and that set of brothers. So, so um, all of that then led me to think about, well, what would it mean for me to um, interact with someone like my brother Mark in heaven, supposedly healed or cured of his Down syndrome? And I guess I began to think about Down syndrome less as a problem that Mark had and more as a set of relationships that Mark had, and that therefore people like myself had with him, um, that were differentiated from other relationships. Maybe Mark's healing and curing will will involve less a matter of an erasure of, if you will, the, the expressive manifestations of his Down syndrome, because we wouldn't say that that our behaviors or the way we look would completely be erased in heaven. Um, they'd be transformed but it would still be recognizable. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed that, well, yeah, Jesus' resurrected body included a scar that allowed his disciples to identify him, mm -hmm. right? That there was something that allowed ongoing recognition. And so then it became the question of, okay, then the, the redemption of someone like Mark in that respect is the redemption of all of us. It's the transformation of who we are, but yet in ways that nevertheless allow our recognition. And, and from that perspective, um, what's wrong with Mark is less Mark's problem than a world that doesn't know how to engage with him, understand him, mm -hmm. respond to him, and embrace him. And maybe what heaven involves is less that Mark gets fixed, but the rest of us get fixed so that now all of a sudden we can enjoy Mark and his contributions in ways that right now we're just a little bit too, um, un not, not as able to do, right? Yeah. Wow about all of these in conversation with scripture and in conversation with um you know other theological resources was a part what led me to to the kinds of things that you introduced yeah so w one question i had was you know you talked about um you know kind of what you said and just a quote from your book says disabilities are not necessarily evil necessarily evil or blemishes to be eliminated most problematic are those whose disabilities are a constitutive constitutive part of their identities I'm just curious, how would you respond? Like, how do you know what is part of their constitutive part of their identity or not? Yeah, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, 
you know, I think of one of my friends, his name is Shane Clifton, and he's written a couple of books as well that talk about his disability. He was, I think, in his late 30s, had a, had a serious accident injury that, that now he's, a, he's been a quadriplegic for like about the last decade, hmm. I believe. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do wonder, for instance, um, what would Shane be like in heaven? Would he be restored to his 39-year-old body? You know, some, the theological tradition said that our resurrected bodies will be uh, 30-year-old bodies. Hmm. And the rationale given for that was that, well, that was Jesus' resurrected body. Hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting, right? Um, Amos resurrected at age 30. Most people probably won't recognize him, hmm. which is maybe a good thing in heaven. But that's besides the point, right? Yeah. That seems pretty arbitrary. Um, hmm. I don't know that we can based too much on the, the age of the resurrection body from, from Jesus' resurrected body at 30. But I, I think part of my point had to do with how aren't identities actually, you know, when, when we ask about constitutive identities, aren't those also formed over time and relationship? That raises some really intriguing questions, for instance, about what happens to an unborn baby mm -hmm. who may be in heaven. Yeah. Right? Um, what is the shape of that of that person? Yeah. Um, is there ways for us to think about heaven as an ongoing unfolding of capacities that that are part of what God as creator has endowed? Hmm. And from that perspective, then aren't identity aren't even constitutive identities um, uh, eternally unfolding? at a certain level so that even embryos can can unfold in their potentiality mm. or if you know a child dies at one year old for whatever set of reasons there's a resurrected body for that child all of a sudden become a 30 year old and who's going to recognize that child mm. or again these are these are in some respects not very helpful because we don't have any answers for them but i think my point would be something like this that if shane lives for a long time in his in a wheelchair Decades, maybe. I, I don't know how long Shane's going to live, right? Um, but at some point, that wheelchair is going to be just simply part of how he makes his way in the world. I mean, people who were born and have grown up in wheelchairs don't know a life and a world apart from a wheelchair. Someone that was born, let's say, blind and, and grows up blind, that's constitutive for his or her identity. They don't mm -hmm. know the world any other way. Mm -hmm. Someone who was born without an arm or someone who was born, you know, with a, a Helen Keller, for instance, Helen Keller's identity is what it is without her hearing and seeing abilities. She's just developed other ways to relate with the world based upon what she has had. And what does a resurrected body look like for Helen Keller? Does she even need ears to hear and eyes to see in heaven mm -hmm. if she's there? Or are the ways in which she's learned how to relate to the world in heaven going to continue to enable her engagement with others in heaven? And maybe what the miracle of heaven involves will be, you and I will be invited into a new modality of engaging others so that Helen Keller ceases to be a person we gaze upon, rather becomes a person who now enriches our lives in a more direct way because the impediments that hinder our social relationships are transformed. I don't know. Those are the kinds of questions I ask as a theologian. I don't know that they keep me up at night, but they certainly make for some interesting book writing. Yeah, definitely. No, no, that's, that's, that's really interesting. You know, constantly transforming, eternally transforming. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah, one other quote I love that you say in the book is, you know, people with disabilities are people first who shouldn't be defined solely by their disabilities. And if possible, they should be consulted rather than cared for paternalistically as if they were completely helpless creatures. I love that. I love that, especially as we think about even just church ministry. You know, when we, especially, let's be honest, in Pentecostal charismatic context, when you see someone with disabilities, do we, when they come in the doors, is, is it the primary thing we think is like, oh, how can we pray for them? Or maybe like, hey, how can they pray for us? And uh, so I really appreciate, you know, the heart that you had in that book. Really super helpful.